Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Cadet Kyle Warren, Vice President for the Class of 2015, and your Master of Ceremonies for this evening's events. I would like to welcome you all to the 500th Night Banquet for the Class of 2015. Let me begin by introducing you to our official party. The Class of 2015 is honored to welcome our guest speaker for the evening, Admiral William McRaven the Superintendent of West Point and his wife, Lieutenant General Robert Caslin and Mrs. Caslin. Also seated at the head tables this evening are the Commandant of Cadets and his wife, Brigadier General Richard Clark and Mrs. Clark, the Dean of the Academic Board and his wife, Brigadier General Timothy Trainer and Colonel Retired Brazel the Command Sergeant Major for the United States Military Academy and his wife, Command Sergeant Major Delbert Byers and Mrs. Byers, the Command Sergeant Major for the United States Corps of Cadets, Command Sergeant Major Robin Duane and Ms. Grimm, and other distinguished guests joining us this evening. Please remain standing for this evening's invocation to be delivered by Cadet Crystal Onyema and remain standing for this evening's toasts. Ladies and gentlemen, please bow your heads with me if you so choose. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together tonight in celebration of 500th night. We give thanks for bringing us this far in our West Point journey, and we look forward to what the next 500 days hold. We are humbled by the many opportunities you have given us to grow, develop, and most importantly, serve. Let us not forget the lessons we have learned and prepare us for the challenges to come. Help us encourage and love our friends to our left and to our right, and inspire us to not only work towards our graduation, but to leave this place better than we found it. In your name we pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please charge your glasses for this evening's toasts. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose a toast to the President of the United States.
Ladies and gentlemen, I propose a toast to the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to propose a toast to the United States Military Academy. Class of 2015, I propose a toast to our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, please ensure that your glasses are charged with water for the fallen comrade toast. As you entered the dining room this evening, you may have noticed a small table in a place of honor. It is set for one military member to represent each of the military services. This table is our way of recognizing the members of our profession of arms who are absent from our midst. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his oppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their motives in answering our nation's call to arms. The chair is empty. They are missing. The napkin is black, the American color from mourning. The single rose reminds us of the hearts of loved ones. It is tied with a yellow ribbon to symbolize the everlasting hope for a joyous reunion with those yet unaccounted for. The single candle flame represents an eternal flame for their sacrifices. The slice of lemon on the bread plate reminds us of their bitter fate. There is also salt, symbolic of the tears endured by the missing and their loved ones. The wine glass is inverted. Our distinguished comrades cannot toast with us this night or join in our festivities. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we solemnly toast, please remain silent. To our comrades, killed in action, missing in action, or prisoners of war. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Fallen Comrade Observance. Please be seated and enjoy your meal. At this time, allow me to welcome our class president, Cadet Will Goodwin. Admiral Craven, General Caslin, distinguished guests in the class of 2015, it's an honor to stand before you tonight as we come together to celebrate this milestone in our time as cadets. Fifty years ago, almost to this day, our affiliate class of 1965 started a new tradition with an event marking 500 nights to graduation. When 1965 joined together for the first 500th night in January of 1964, the nation and the Corps of Cadets faced a time of mourning and uncertainty following the loss of President Kennedy a mere two months prior. In the wake of such great tragedy, the class decided that it was time for a celebration, and they petitioned the superintendent for a chance to come together and look ahead to the future, and 500th night was born. President Kennedy himself said that change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. 2015, on this cold January night, more than 50 years later, these words still ring true to our own West Point journey. It's easy to become lost in our day-to-day -day routines here at West Point and lose perspective becoming victims in the present. It's even easier to look back at the challenges that we've faced together over the last two years and wonder if we could have done things differently in the past. Tonight, though, we're here to celebrate and look ahead to our shared future. 
both over the next 500 days at West Point and upon graduation when we open a new chapter as second lieutenants in our nation's army. We have so much to look forward to over the next 500 days and so many people to be thankful for as we look around the mess hall this evening. So tonight and this weekend, please enjoy each other's company and especially the company of our guests who have traveled from across the country and in some cases around the world to be with us this evening. The class of 1965 will be the first to tell you via email, of course, that they knew how to throw a party back in the day. I trust that we will not let them down in our own celebrations this weekend. So please stay safe. I think Admiral McRaven would agree with me when I say that if your celebrations keep you out later than zero dark 30 tonight, be sure that you have a plan to get home safely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in a warm welcome for the 59th Superintendent of the United States Military Academy, Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin Jr. Okay, Will, very well said. Great thoughts, thank you very much. Well, welcome distinguished guests and family and friends of the great class of 2015, and welcome for those we lead, 2015, great job. 500 days, actually someone told me it's 490 days, who would have ever thought? Nevertheless, tonight is a significant threshold as you enter your final 490 days before your commissioning. It's a day of celebration indeed perhaps also a day of reflection of wherever you've come these last two and a half years. Maybe it's a day of commitment or recommitment. But whatever it is, know the opportunity for leadership is on the table waiting for you to pick it up. Your nation, our nation will need you and you're gonna answer the call to duty and you'll be ready to go and you'll be great. So 2015, well done, congratulations, we're very proud of you. Tonight is my distinct honor to introduce our guest speaker, Admiral William H. McRaven, the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, headquarters down at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida, but operating worldwide. As the commander at Admiral McRaven is responsible for accomplishing the SOCOM mission, which is to provide fully capable special operating forces from all services to defend the United States and its interests and to synchronize planning of global operations against terrorist networks. As a Naval ROTC graduate from the great University of Texas, and sir, we're very glad you're ROTC Navy, if you were our arch, arch rival academy down there at Maryland, either someone else would have been here right now, <laughs> or you'd be up here by yourself and we'd all be down at I call already. Just kidding, of course. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> but seriously, um, Admiral McRaven has commanded at every level within the special operations community, including assignments as SEAL Platoon Commander, Squadron Commander at Naval Special Warfare Development Group, Task Force Commander during Desert Shield and Desert Storm, Task Group Commander in CENTCOM Area of Responsibility, Commander of SEAL Team 3, Commodore of Naval Special Warfare Group 1, Commander of Special Operations Command Europe, Commander Joint Special Operations Command at Fort Bragg, North Carolina but probably most noteworthy, Admiral McRaven is credited for organizing and executing Operation Neptune Spear, the special ops raid that led to the death of Osama bin Laden on May 2nd, 2011, and that is worth an applause in itself. So it is clearly my honor to welcome this great leader to our academy, mm -hmm. class of 2015. Will you please join me in a warm welcome for one of our military's very best, Admiral William McRaven, Commander of Special Operations Command. Sir, thank you.
Well, thank you very much. Good evening, General and Mrs. Caslin, General and Mrs. Clark, General Trainer, Colonel Brazel, Command Sergeant Major, distinguished guests, and most important class of 2015. Bob, thanks so very much for that uh, overly generous introduction. And I will tell you that I am truly, truly honored to be here tonight to address the future leaders of the United States Army. But as a graduate of a state school in Texas who majored in journalism because I couldn't do math or science or engineering or accounting and whose academic prowess resulted in a graduating GPA of 2.9, of which I was very proud, I am, I am somewhat intimidated by the thought of giving any advice to any cadet on anything. Nevertheless, after almost 37 years in the service, a number of those with the Army, there may be something I can offer. So tonight, as you begin the final 500 days of your time in the United States, at the United States Military Academy, I would like to give you a sailor's perspective on the Army. Not the Army of the Hudson, not the Army of the history books, not the Army portrayed in the countless murals across campus, but the Army you will enter in 500 days, the Army upon which the future of this nation rests, the Army that you will shape and the Army that you will lead. So if you will humor this old sailor, I will tell you what I've learned from my time in serving with the Army. In the past 12 years, I have worked for the great generals of this generation, Dempsey, Petraeus, Odierno, McChrystal, Austin, Rodriguez, and Daly, all graduates of the Military Academy, each man different in his own way. Dempsey, a man of great humor and compassion whose quick wit and keen tactical sense allowed him to secure Baghdad as a division commander, lead the Central Command as a three-star, and today as the chairman, he presides over the greatest challenge in our military since World War II, and he does so with tremendous reason intelligence, and with a song in his heart. Petraeus, whose understanding of the strategic nature of war was unparalleled, who saw opportunity in every challenge, and who dared greatly in hopes of great victories. His daily command decisions in Iraq and Afghanistan unquestionably saved the lives of thousands of young soldiers. Odierno, a soldier's soldier, who as a division and corps commander in Iraq fought with a fierceness one would expect of a great warrior. And then as the commander in Iraq combined that fierceness with a diplomat's subtle hand to lead and shape the future of a sovereign Iraq. And today, he leads the greatest army in the world. Austin, the quiet bear whose deep intellect and incomparable combat experience allowed him to think through every complex problem and to succeed where others might have failed. McChrystal, whose creative mind and intense drive for perfection changed forever how special operations would fight on the battlefield and changed how soft would be perceived by the nation. And in doing so, likely changed the course of the armed forces as well. Rodriguez, the everyman's general, who proves time and again that character matters, that hard work, Perseverance, persistence, and toughness on the battlefield are always traits of success. And Del Daly, whose boldness and innovation, coupled with a Night Stalker's sense of teamwork and aggressiveness, began the revolution in special operations. What did I learn about the Army in watching these men and other great leaders like Keith Alexander, Chuck Jacoby, Mike Scaparotti, John Campbell, Bob Caslin, and Rich Clark? Well. I learned first and foremost that your allegiance as an officer is always, always to the nation and to those civilian leaders who were elected by the people, who represent the people. The oath you took is clear, to support and defend the Constitution, not the institution, not the Army, not the Corps, not the division, not the brigade, not the battalion, not the company, not the platoon, and not the squad, the nation. I learned that leadership is hard. Carl von Clausewitz once said that everything in war is easy, but the easy things are difficult. Leadership sounds easy in the books, 
but it is quite difficult in real life. I learned that it is difficult because it is a human interaction and nothing. Nothing is more daunting, more frustrating, more complex than trying to lead men and women in tough times. Those officers that do it well earn your respect because doing it poorly is commonplace. You will be challenged to do it well. I learned that taking care of soldiers is not about coddling them. It's about challenging them, establishing a standard of excellence and holding them accountable for reaching it. I learned that good officers lead from the front. I can't count the number of times that I saw Petraeus without body armor walking the streets of Mosul, Baghdad, or Ramadi to, show the to share the dangers with his men and to show the enemy that he wasn't afraid. Or McChrystal, jockeying up to go on a long patrol with his rangers or seals in Afghanistan. Dempsey on a spur ride in Iraq. Austin at the head of his division during the invasion of Iraq. Odierno, cigar in mouth, rumbling through the streets of Basra. Rodriguez and Daly, always center stage during the tough fights in Iraq and Afghanistan. I learned that if you're in combat, move to where the action is the hottest. Spend time with the soldiers being miserable, exhausted, and scared. If you're a Black Hawk pilot or a tank commander, spend some time on the flight line or in the motor pool with the maintainers and the wrench turners. Whatever position or branch you are in, find the toughest, the most dangerous, the shittiest job in your unit and go do it. I learned that you won't get a lot of thanks in doing so. I learned that you shouldn't expect it. Your soldiers are doing the tough job every day, but I guarantee you, you will learn a lot about your troops and they will learn a lot about you. I learned that the great ones know how to fail. In the course of your Army career, you will likely fail and fail often. Nothing so steals you for battle like failure. No great leader I watched got it right every time, but the great ones know that when they fail, they must pick themselves up, learn from their mistakes, and move on. Rudyard Kipling, the great British storyteller, poet, and soldier once wrote, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowances for their doubting too, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, yours is the earth and everything that's in it and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. If you can't stomach failure, then you will never be a great leader. I learned the great Army officers are risk takers, but the greatest risk is not always on the battlefield, but in standing up for what's right. I have seen a young lieutenant stand up to a colonel when the officer's behavior was out of line. I have seen a captain challenge a general about a flawed battle plan. I have seen many a general privately confront their civilian leadership and question the merits of national decisions. All Army officers are expected to take risks in battle. The truly great ones know that real victory is achieved when men and women of character take professional risks and challenge the weak need, the faint of heart, the indecisive, or the bullies. And finally, in watching Army officers, young and old, I learned that the great ones are equally good at following as they are at leading. Following is one of the most underrated aspects of leadership, and each of you will be asked to follow someone else. The strength of a good unit rests more on how well the officers follow the commander, sometimes, than how well they lead their own soldiers. I've seen many a good battalion and company underachieve because someone in the officer ranks thought the commander was an idiot and quietly, quietly worked to undermine his authority. I guarantee you that in the course of your career, you will work for leaders whom you don't like and you don't respect. It will be easy to make fun of their idiosyncrasies, their receding hairline, their soft chin, or their spouse, but be very careful about getting too smug, too opinionated, and too righteous. As long as the actions of your commander are moral, legal, and ethical, then do everything you can to support the chain of command and avoid the rolling eyes, the whisper campaigns, and the junior officer dissension. I learned that great Army officers know how to follow. And what about the soldiers you will lead? In my career, I have been fortunate to have served beside soldiers 
from the Screaming Eagles of the 101st Division, the Paratroopers of the All-American Division, the Big Red One, the 1st Armored, 1st Cav, 10th Mountain, 1st, 3rd, and 4th Infantry Division, all the regiments of Special Forces, and my beloved Army Rangers. I learned that the greatest privilege the Army can bestow upon you is to give you the opportunity to lead such magnificent men and women. These soldiers are not without their challenges. Your soldiers will at times question your authority. They will undermine your action. They will mislead you, frustrate you, disappoint you, and fail you. But when the chips are down, and I mean really down, they will be there. And they will inspire you with their courage, their sense of duty, their leadership, their love, and their respect. In difficult times, your soldiers will be everything you dreamed they would be and more. All one has to do is look at the citations that accompany the actions of Sergeant Sal Guenta, Leroy Petrie, Robbie Miller, Ty Carter, Jared Monty, Ross McGinnis, Paul Smith, and Clint Romashaw. Men whose unparalleled heroism above and beyond the call of duty was only apparent moments before their brothers and sisters were threatened. I learned that your soldiers are at their best when their brothers and sisters in arms are threatened. They are at their best when life deals them the hardest of blows and their indomitable spirit shines through. In 2007, I visited the intensive care unit in Landstuhl, Germany, where the Army was sending all of its most critically injured from Iraq. As I walked into the sterile room, clad from head to toe in a clean white garb, a man lay naked on the bed in front of me, missing one leg above the knee, part of the other foot removed. He was swollen beyond recognition from the blast of an IED. The doctor in attendance didn't know the man's unit or service. I asked the man if he was a Marine or a soldier. Unable to talk, he pointed to his thigh. There on what was left of his thigh was a tattoo, 1st Infantry Division. You're a soldier, I remarked. He nodded. An infantryman, I said. He smiled through what was left of his face, and then he picked up a clipboard upon which he had been writing. He looked me in, his, in the eye, and he wrote on the paper, I will be infantry again, exclamation point. And somehow I knew he would. Just like the young ranger in the cache at Bagram, who had both his legs amputated and was also unable to speak, the nurse at his bedside said that he could sign. His mother was deaf and he had learned sign language at a young age. He was so very young, and part of me must have shown a small sign of pity for this ranger whose life had just been devastated. With a picture of the hand gestures in front of me, the ranger, barely able to move in an excruciating pain, signed, I will be okay. A year later, I saw him at the regimental change of command. He was wearing his prosthetic shorties, smiling from ear to ear and challenging the rangers around him to a pull-up contest. He was okay. Just like the young female sergeant who I visited in Walter Reed this week, she was seriously injured in a parachute accident. With her father by her side, she laughed it off like it was a scratch. She'd been in the hospital for two months and she had years of rehabilitation ahead of her, but she had no self-pity, no remorse, no regrets, just determination to get back to her unit. These soldiers and tens of thousands like them will be the warriors you lead. You had better be up to the task because I have learned that they expect you to be good. And most importantly, I learned that they expect you to hold them to the very highest standards. These soldiers join the service to be part of something special. And if they are not held to a high standard, if their individual efforts are no more important, no more appreciated than the efforts of a slacker, then it will directly affect the morale of the unit. And I have learned that nothing is more important than the morale of a unit. MacArthur once said of morale that it cannot be produced by pampering or coddling an army, and it is not necessarily destroyed by hardship, danger, or even calamity. It will wither quickly, however, if soldiers come to believe themselves the victims of indifference or injustice on the part of their leaders. The great leaders in the Army never, 
accept indifference or injustice, and they only judge their soldiers based on the merit of their work. Nothing else is important. Not the soldier's size, not their color, not their general, gender, not their orientation, not their religion, not their ethnicity, nothing is more important but how well your soldiers do their job. I am confident that history will reflect that the young Americans who enlisted in the Army after 9-11 were equal in greatness to their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers who fought in the World Wars. And in 500 days, you will inherit these incredible soldiers. Be ready. Finally, in watching the Army for most of my career, I learned that no institution in the world has the history, the legacy, the traditions, nor the pride that comes from being a soldier. I am envious beyond words. I learned that whether you serve four years or 40 years, you will never, ever regret your decision to have joined the United States Army. You will serve beside the finest men and women in America. You will be challenged every day. You will fail, you will succeed, you will grow. You will have adventures to fill 10 lifetimes and stories that your friends from home will never be able to understand. Your children and their children and their children's children will be incredibly proud of your service. And when you pass from this earth, the nation that you serve so well will honor you for your duty, and your only regret will be that you could not have served longer. And if for one moment you believe that because Iraq is over and Afghanistan is winding down, that the future holds few challenges for you, then you are terribly, terribly mistaken. Because as long as there are threats to this great nation, the army upon which the nation was founded will be the cornerstone of its security, its freedom, and its future. And you, as Army officers, will shape that future, secure our freedoms, and protect us from harm. So what have I learned? I learned that there is no more noble calling in the world than to be a soldier in the United States Army. Good luck to all of you as you complete the final 500 days. May God bless America, and may we always have the privilege to serve her. Thank you very much. Admiral McRaven, sir, on behalf of the class, I'd like to present you with this West Point Cadet Saber as a small token of our appreciation. The inscription reads, Admiral William H. McRaven, 500th night guest speaker, with sincere appreciation, class of 2015, United States Corps of Cadets, 18 January 2014. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please ensure that your glasses are charged for the final toast. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose a toast to the class of 2015. For those we lead. Please remain standing for the benediction offered by Cadet Amanda Harrison.
Please bow your heads with me if you so choose. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate this milestone in our cadet careers, we thank you for the guests who could join us tonight, for the hands that prepared our meal, and for the fellowship we have enjoyed. Assist us in keeping our remaining 500 nights at the Academy in perspective, and in remembering to cherish the close bonds that unite us. I pray you continue to help us in our endeavor to live above the common level of life. Change our hearts, Lord, to become better able to serve as we advance towards our goal of graduation. We give thanks with grateful hearts for the abundant blessings you have provided us. And as this evening concludes, we ask that you bless our class and our family and friends here with us tonight with safety throughout the remainder of the weekend. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. Before we conclude this evening's festivities, there are several people that the class would like to thank for making this evening possible. And we ask that you please hold your applause until we've read all of the names. Our sincere pre appreciation to Lieutenant Colonel Alex Deverona, our class advisor, and our class officer in charge, Captain Jeff Auer, for all of their direction and support in planning this event. We would also like to thank the Directorate of Cadet Activities, the Cadet Hostess Office, and the many other organizations that have made this evening such a success. Particularly, we would like to recognize the Mess Hall staff for all of their hard work in preparing and serving this excellent meal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending our 500th night banquet. This concludes the formal portion of the evening. Remember that the wine glass is your memento, so please take it with you. We welcome you to visit the historic Column Hall immediately following the banquet where the Benny Havens Band will be performing at the hop. Please drive safely and have a great night. <laughs>